welcome to the Best Place to Work podcast, where we promise actionable tips from real business leaders on building amazing work cultures. Not tips from Google, but tips from the trenches of real world businesses just like yours. Super excited to bring you this bonus episode. Today we have five-time founder, podcaster, author, CEO, David Cancel joining the podcast to talk about lessons that he's learned the hard way. David is currently running Drift, which is a tech startup in Boston. And so without wasting any more time, let's just jump right into the interview with David. So today we're here with David Cancel, who's the CEO of Drift. Um, now, for those of you that don't know David, he's a 5X founder of tech companies primarily. Um, he was previously with HubSpot prior to starting Drift, who was, he was the chief product officer there, um, led teams as that, as that company grew and now is, is growing Drift, which is doing amazing things. Um, welcome to the show, David. Thanks for having me, Mike. I'm so excited to be on this show and I love the mission that you're on. Thanks. Now t- give us a little bit of the elevator pitch here of Drift and what you guys do just to set the stage. Sure. I think the easiest way to think about it is that Drift makes it easy for your customers to buy. And we focus on B2B companies today, although we have lots of companies that are e-commerce and B2C who sign up to use us. But really, our focus is on those companies that are B2B, and we help the demand gen marketer and the sales team be better at getting back to people when they're ready to buy. And so what we're trying to replace is the old school way of doing things, which is come to a website, fill out forms, get spammed with a bunch of emails, and maybe one magical day someone will get back to you when you become qualified. And what we're trying to say is no one buys like that anymore. And so you should be able to connect people inside of your companies to talk to the right people as they actually land on your website and uh, are interested in more information. Sure. That's awesome. No, we, we actually have Drift on our site um, and love it. So it's, it's a great product. Oh, thanks for that, man. So um, I'm interested. I, you know, I was just reading, you had an article in the New York Times, I believe. And it was interesting because in there you tell a story about how a lot of your formative lessons on management were from your 20s mm-hmm. and when you were working in a warehouse for a Taiwanese <laughs> man named Sam. My first mentor. So, yeah, so tell me tell me a little bit about that because that that was pre HubSpot, you know, pre building this team at Drift. I mean, yes. that you since then have had a lot of experience, but you know, it's interesting you bring that up. So I I'd, I'd love to hear that story. You know, as time, you know, maybe and this has happened to you as as you get older and time passes on, the more that you start to look back at those early lessons, right? Those formative lessons, which, you know, at the time you didn't have the context to kind of appreciate what you were learning. Right. It's like, you know, it takes you a lifetime to learn the stuff that your grandmother tried to teach you when you were young. Right. And your grandmother knew everything and she was right. But we couldn't listen to her back then. So Sam, (laughs) Sam was uh, my first mentor. Right. Although he didn't know it and I didn't know it at the time. And uh, and I worked for Sam Lee was his name. He was a Taiwanese businessman who owned uh, many warehouses and kind of. B2B businesses, right, in, in, in New York City, a long time ago. And, uh, and what was amazing about Sam was that, one, it wasn't official mentorship, but he's, he proved to be this amazing mentor. Uh, I learned the power of uh, humility through Sam. He was a man who was very successful, the most successful man I had met uh, up to that time. Uh, but no one who worked for him or no one that knew him knew how successful he was because he was very modest. He was the first one to grab a broom. He was the first one in, the last one out, and the first one to jump in and, and help. And, and many people who worked for him didn't actually know that he was the owner of these companies. So I learned that lesson from him. I learned uh, the lesson of giving people kind of outsized responsibility and, uh, and letting them fail and letting them learn through that failure, but, and then being there not to criticize when the failure happens, but to, you know, but to kind of make, turn that into a teachable moment. And again, all these lessons I can now look back, and I've had a series of, of other mentors, but I look back at Sam and say, wow, he was teaching me so many things uh, that, I, that I rely on today that I didn't really understand at that point. Yeah, I didn't appreciate mm-hmm. until you kind of lived it out a little bit. Maybe you didn't do it the right way. Exactly. And then I definitely came back didn't do it the right way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now it, to me, it seems like as people are going through the transition of, of, of their company growing and they have to get middle tiers of management, 
they struggle with that delegation, which is mm-hmm. exactly what you said. You know, it's like they, they're like, ah, I don't really trust this person to fail or I don't want them to fail, you know. And then tell me about like the the struggle that maybe you've had with that in the past and what it was rooted in. Was it rooted in a lack of trust or something else? Yeah, that's a, uh, such a deep question. It's such an important question to uh, to focus in on. I'd say, you know, the way that I think about it is that it's taken me my entire career, 20 years now of doing this, to be able to say three words, right? Three words that are very difficult for most of us to say. And those three words are, I don't know. It's taken me this long to be able to be comfortable with myself and comfortable enough with my experience to be able to say that not only to myself, but to my team, to my investors, to my peers, and to say, I don't know. You know, and, but of course, the follow up is, but we'll figure out a way to do it. And uh, we have the, great, the right people on the team and, uh, and we can do this. But, you know, I don't know. And I think most of my early career was plagued with not wanting to say that like most of us. And what that meant was uh, probably managing the wrong way, not wanting, to give out, not wanting to delegate, not wanting to share autonomy, right, and re- be very controlling, which is, you know, what you read in books or, or old business books, I should say. And because I was so afraid to say that I didn't know, I didn't have the answer, and you've, you, you kind of almost always felt like you could never say that. You had to have the answer. We had to have figured out a way. And some plan, even though now we can laugh back and say, like, most of the ideas we have are wrong and they're going to continue to be wrong. And um, and so you shouldn't get too worked up on having the right idea because there, there's almost never such a thing. There are just options and there are paths that we can take and decisions we can make. And then there are consequences that happen because of those. Yeah. No, I think that's interesting that you say that because I think that's a – people justify their role in leadership as saying, oh, I have the best answers, or maybe I know the the product or the industry the best, um, which I, that doesn't necessarily qualify you for leadership. Nope. But w- what would you say um, then for, to someone that is struggling with that, that they're struggling to say, I don't know. You said shared autonomy, which I thought was really interesting mm-hmm. because it's almost like you you don't want to share that autonomy, which, which is – it's all tied into that. But what would you say then is really the role of that leader if if they're not supposed to have all the answers and what are they supposed to do? You know, <laughs> I think uh, so many roles. I'd say the first role is making sure you have the right people on the bus. So that to me, uh, business is solely about people, right? And those people are your customers. Those people are the your partners and those people are the people within your company on the team. That's how everything works, right? We're not in the world where as advanced as we are that we buy and sell from bots, right? Like it's still humans at the end of the day who make these decisions, no matter how large the company. And so it's people to people. And so therefore 99% of the problems and 99% of the solutions are stem from people, right? And so we got to get that right. And um, and so for people who think about like, how do, they, how do they share that autonomy or how do you how do you give autonomy? You know, what I found after doing it wrong for half my career, so the first half, I did it wrong. The second half, what I did was to, to start to look at these ideas uh, around servant leadership and around being basically embodying what I learned from Sam, right? I didn't realize that at the time, but Sam was the first servant leader that I experienced because his job was getting the right people on the bus, his job was to support, even if that meant that he had to do the most menial of tasks, which he was the first to do, uh, support those people on the team to make sure that those people could uh, could have the best opportunity of having the most impact on the business, even though that meant that he was doing things that uh, that that were, you know, you would consider menial or, you know, most people consider that they didn't scale or was not a waste of time. He was there to support, almost like a coach, right? Support them and let them shine. And and that's kind of the approach I've taken for the last decade, which is for most of us, if you look at most of our companies, the lion's share of the, of the headcount, the number of people, are those people that are not in leadership, right? They are the, they yeah. are the, the individuals. They are the people who every day can affect change the most. And most companies put them in a situation where the lion's share, the 95%, if not more, of the total headcount has no power. 
and the power is concentrated in 5% or less of the company. And to me, now I can look back at that and think that, well, that's upside down. 5% from a total headcount, just from a number standpoint, can't have that much effect. Why not give the power to the 95% who can have the biggest impact and, by the way, are almost always the, the ones that are closest to the problem and closest to the customer? No, I think that's huge. That's, that, that's getting deep on your end. <laughs> <laughs> I could go um, deep on this forever. That's right. <laughs> so I, I'm interested to hear, too, I, I think everything that you just said is, is something that you can hear and you can understand, but it takes a you know, decade to, mm-hmm. to get right and to figure out what it actually means in, in practice. But you know, for someone that maybe um, is starting a new company or going through that transition, um, how, what are the things that you did, you know, leaving HubSpot after, you know, building that team, but you kind of probably inherited some culture, inherited some things, mm-hmm. and then you started Drift, and how many employees do you guys have now? Around 40. 40, okay. So you're right, you're get, you're at that cusp, you know, you're, you're growing to that point. What are some some fundamental things, would you say, that you started off on the right foot when you when you started Drift? that you could suggest to the team? Mm-hmm. Good question. So I'd say um, that, Im- that having that importance from day one of getting the right people on the bus, having the right people on the team, and, uh, and you know, as, as most of us build companies and we try to scale them and we're running around, you know, like, like uh, you know, with chickens with their heads cut off, uh, as we try to scale and try to, you know, it's easy to overlook the people that you're hiring and the people on your team and the amount of time that you're spending coaching those people, right? And so I love this kind of concept um, that I'll steal from Kim Scott. She has a great book called Radical Candor, which I suggest to everyone listening. And that that concept is that there are no B B players, right? That that's false. There's no B players. There's everyone has the opportunity to be an A player in the right context, uh, with the right role, and in the right relationship. Right, so all those things have to align. So the stars have to align, and if they do, someone, each of us can be an A player for some particular piece of domain. And so it's our job as leaders to figure out, like, can we get them, get that person there? What do we need to do to be able to get that that person there? And maybe sometimes it's the wrong context, the wrong company, the wrong uh, group that it won't work. Right, so the problem could be totally our problem and not their problem. And in that case, it might be the wrong person on the bus. But that's where I would suggest everyone spend their time. And, uh, and spending time thinking about, like, kind of um, defining culture and doing all of the kind of nice stuff, the f- more fluffier stuff, which I think is important, I would push to later once you really have that, that company going up and running and you have a, a little critical mass of a team going and not to spend too much time on that and spend more time on, on coaching and making sure you have the right people there. Yeah, which it sounds like the coaching is the first thing to go out the window if you're frantically hiring yes. people, frantically growing. Yes, it's the growing. most important thing, right? The, yeah. the, most, the, the, the thing that I see happen all the time is the first thing to go is the things that we kind of interpret that they don't scale, right? Mm-hmm. Common Conventional wisdom would say, oh, you know, one-on-ones don't scale. So that's the first thing to go out the window. And to me, one-on-ones are the key to scaling a team are the fundamental thing that you need to do to scale a team, whether you have hundreds, if not thousands, of people within your company. It's the thing that you can't give on, but yet for most companies, it's the first thing they give on. That was a nice little segue to shout out to our sponsor, waypointhq.com, which fosters one-on-ones with your employees. So <laughs> thanks awesome. for teeing nice that up there. That. <laughs> that's great. Um, so no, thanks. That That's that's awesome. Um Delivering the value like I knew you would, David. So thank you so much. Um, one last question before we go is you are a tech startup. So naturally you hire a bunch of young people. You know, I look at your your company photos and it's like all these young 20-somethings, maybe early 30 people. And, you know, that that's always a problem for companies <laughs> that maybe have an older group of people that they're trying they're to like hire me. young people. Yeah, it's like how do you do this? And that, that's a common complaint that you hear and it's, it's stereotypical and all this. But – what would you say is the biggest challenge that you've had um, to hiring young people? And then what is the biggest upside? What value did they bring that maybe you didn't see or people don't see? Yeah, I'd say the biggest, I'll start with the, the biggest value. So I'd say the biggest value is that they don't have bad habits that you have to undo, right? And so they don't have this um, 
this condition of, well, this is the way it's always been done. This is the way that I've been taught. This is the way that I do it, right? And so they're, they're more open-minded because of that. The flip side of that, right? Everything that's a, that is a strength is, is also a weakness. The weakness of that is that they don't have it, so you need to develop those skills. You need to train those skills, and that's an investment that you need to make, right? So everything, there's a plus and minus, on, you know, yin and yang. And so I'd say, to me, that, that you know, not having those preconceived notions is such a benefit that I'm willing to invest in training them and getting them up to speed. And most people, I'd say, don't want to, or I, I shouldn't speak for most people, I should just say what I see is common is that uh, people don't want to put in the time to make that investment. And so they'll say like, oh, you know, these kids today, you know, all those kind of stereotypical things uh, that we hear because they're not willing to put in that investment. They're not w- willing to put in that one-to-one coaching. Awesome. No, that was great. Thank you so much, David. You could find David at drift.com as his company. So if, you, if you're looking for solutions for your marketing and sales team, maybe you're stagnant in there, check out Drift. It's an amazing product. You can also hear him at seekingwisdom.io, which is his podcast on management and growing teams. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Mike, it's yeah. always a pleasure, and uh, I'm always uh, happy to learn from you about what you're doing and your audience. Yeah, cool. I, thank you so much for being on the show, David. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, man. Thanks so much for listening. If you found the show valuable, please give us some love on iTunes. But if there's any reason that you would rate us less than five stars, please let me know. Shoot me a note at mike at bestplacetoworkpodcast.com. Thanks. Thanks.